Welcome to Palm Sunday Worship here at McFarland. We're glad you're connecting. My name is Rockford Johnson. I serve as senior pastor here, and it's my great joy to welcome you. Welcome guests. Welcome everyone. Welcome as we engage in scripture and prayer and singing to hear what God has to say for us today. Please let us know you're worshiping with us by clicking on the link in the chat box or going to our website, McFarlandUMC.org, and there also submit your prayer requests and concerns and celebrations. We'd love to be in prayer with you and for you, and so we hope you'll do that, and we'll take those and pray along with you. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. together in our Palm Sunday call to worship. Jesus entered into Jerusalem humbly on a donkey, seeking to transform the people. People gathered from everywhere to wave palm branches and praise him as royalty. Jesus enters into our lives humbly, seeking to transform our hearts and lives. Let us worship Jesus Christ together and receive him into our presence. Hosanna in the highest.
As we come to this time of prayer and giving, I want to remind you that you can give online through our website or through our McFarland app. You can also mail in your gift or bring it by the church. And I especially want to remind you during this holy season as we approach Easter that it is our tradition at McFarland to take up a special Easter offering. And all of that offering goes to support our Thursday Utilities Assistance Ministry. This is the main offering that they use throughout the whole year to change lives that change the world. And so you can go online, uh, designate your offering for the Easter offering, mail in your check, and make sure you have that written in the memo line. And all of your gift will go to support this wonderful ministry. We have so much to give thanks for this day, and so let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, on the journey of life, you are our guide and our companion. From our beginning to our end, you are there. You run this race alongside us, at times encouraging us, at times comforting us, at times tending to our wounds at times carrying us when we don't think we can take another step. Oh God, for six weeks we have been on a Lenten journey and you have been right here with us, with us in our discipline and devotion, with us in our weakness and failure, with us in our fear, with us in our hope. God, as we spend this final week with Jesus in Jerusalem, we are amazed once again by his gentle spirit and fierce determination. As he confronts those who challenge him, he confronts our own stubbornness and defiant wills. As he cares even for those who hate him, we are challenged to love as he loves. As he bears witness to the emergence of your kingdom, our eyes are open to your presence all around us. As he moves with resolve toward his dark destiny, we find ourselves struggling to understand why it has to be this way. Oh God, the journey is not just about the destination, it is about each step along the way. The journey itself is a blessing with all of its joys and sorrows. And as we run this race, you are shaping us into new people. As we move with you, we are continually born anew. And so help us to be attentive to each step, in the darkness and in the light. Help us to fully experience all that we encounter, the good and the bad, for in it all we discover you. Oh God, draw us ever closer to Christ so that we may turn our hearts and our minds to all that he experienced during this holy week, a week of both terrible and wonderful events. And hear us even now as we join our voices to his, saying together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is John chapter 12, verses 9 through 19. <clears throat> Hear now these words. When the great crowd of Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So that chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they had heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we come into this moment wanting to hear what you have to say through the words that I have to say. So give us your spirit, enlighten the eyes of our hearts, help us to think together, feel together, and know together what your word is for each of us this day as we come seeking the nurture of our lives and the advance of the mission of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The 1993 movie Cool Runnings is loosely based on the story of the first Jamaican bobsled team in the 1988 <clears throat> Winter Olympics. <clears throat> it tells the story of how Derice, who failed to qualify for the 100 meters in the Summer Olympics, decides to put together this first ever, and rather unlikely for a warm climate nation, Jamaican bobsled team to go to the Winter Olympics. He gathers up a few athletes and finds an old coach, and they train and eventually get an old bobsled. And being from Jamaica, they struggle to adapt to the cold and to learn the art of team bobsledding. They have plenty of struggles and suffering, but qualify for the finals. The first day, they finish last. Doris's teammate, Sonka, convinces Doris to stop trying to copy the Swiss team and do it the Jamaican way. Second day, they improve and finish in eighth place. In the final race, one of the blades comes off uh, comes off of the sled, breaks off, and the whole sled and the crew flip upside down and crash at this dangerously high speed. The four men in the sled ride that defeated contraption until it comes to a stop. There's a pause. Doris speaks up. Sanka, are you dead, man? Sanka replies, yeah, man. But determined to finish the race, the Jamaicans pick up the bobsled and carry it across the finish line, earning the applause and the cheers of the whole crowd as they cross that line. In the Gospel of John, the telling of the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as he moves towards his death on the cross is the story of two dead men walking. Lazarus, who has walked out of and away from death because of the intervention of Jesus, but will eventually die a human death again. And Jesus, who is walking toward his death in the days to come, determined to finish his mission. 
It is in this Gospel of John that we find the famous last words of Jesus, it is finished. That is, his life reaches a courageous fulfillment of purpose. Jesus accomplishes the mission to reveal the power of the love of God for all the world. We hear that same sentiment echoed in the book of 2 Timothy, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Faithfulness, while we live, is lifted up as our calling and the work of our faith. That is the point of the way John tells the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem to the applause of palm branches and to the cheers of Hosanna, greeting him as God's Messiah. The crowd is filled with expectations, not that he will die, but that he will overthrow the Roman government and become the long-expected king in the capital city. Jesus has been warned that there is a plot to kill him because of his rising popularity and his credibility that worries the religious leaders. They fear that the Romans will grow impatient with the potential for a riot or rebellion because it's festival time and all these people are gathered in Jerusalem and they may come down hard on the leaders of Jerusalem, of Judaism. But Jesus will not be deterred. He intends to teach and to act to show the way of God no matter what. And until he utters that final word, finished. So the way John tells the story of what we call Palm Sunday is much shorter than the other Gospels, and he ties it uniquely to the story of the raising of Lazarus found only in this Gospel. In the previous chapter, Jesus gets a message from the sisters of Lazarus that their brother is sick and in need of healing. Now, Jesus intentionally delays going so that Lazarus apparently will die and that he can then return him to life. When he does go, Lazarus has been dead for four days. His sisters are both sad and angry. Jesus has already told his disciples that he delayed going so that he can increase their faith, cause them to believe that God is working in him and through him. Jesus is not without compassion. We're told he is greatly disturbed by the grief of his friends, Mary and Martha, and the death of his friend, Lazarus. As you may know, the raising of Lazarus is one of seven carefully selected miracles that John includes in his telling of the story of Jesus, signs, as he calls them, Signs of God's presence and performance in and through Jesus. In fact, it is clear that the miraculous resuscitation of Lazarus becomes the witness to God's energy in Jesus that generates the large crowds that come out to greet Jesus, to welcome him with palm branches. The crowd that witnessed Lazarus walking out of the tomb all bound up like a mummy in grave wrappings, is the crowd that by their testimony generates the interest and the exuberance of the crowd that welcomes Jesus now as he approaches the city. So let's focus on Lazarus. He is raised to live again, but now as a living sign and witness to God's purpose. And to do so, he must have courage. There is now a plot to kill Lazarus him, since his being alive generates so much trust and popularity for Jesus and so many new followers that some fear he will upset the status quo and disturb what is going on, what is normal. And so, like Paul writes in Romans 6, Lazarus is raised to walk in newness of life. He's raised to walk as a living testimony to the purpose of God. After Jesus calls him out of the tomb, he instructs the people there, unbind him and let him live. Let him walk and talk and eat and laugh and sleep, but only that normal sleep 
up each night and then rise each morning to live faithfully. Unwrap him, set him free to breathe, to walk in the sun and the wind, and to make known the glory of the love of God. He is set free to finish the race. Jesus also lives, speaks, and acts, and does so to reveal a fresh understanding of God. In coming close to Jerusalem, he comes close to those who are plotting to kill him. He walks into dangerous territory because he is on a mission. He is staring death in the face with courage and purpose and holy determination. Jesus intends to finish the race, to be faithful all the way to the end. In high school, I read the 1949 memoir of journalist John Gunther about the life of his son, Johnny, who died of a brain tumor at the age of 17. The title, Death Be Not Proud, is taken from a sonnet written by the poet and clergy person John Donne in 1609. Now, Johnny Gunther was a smart and determined boy and young man. And during the ups and downs of the 15-month ordeal he went through, he remains upbeat and intellectual, thinking about his condition. When his physical activity is limited, he occupies himself in the garage working on science projects and with visits from friends. He recovers from treatments and plows back into catching up with his schoolwork again and again and again. And when he can no longer return to school, he writes letters to the faculty to manage getting his assignments done. He gets tutoring and he inquires with his math teacher about taking a very important algebra test. All along, there is a roller coaster of great challenges, renewed hopes, and dashed expectations. On June 4 of 1947, Johnny graduates and despite ill health, walks to get his diploma. On June 30th, he enters the hospital with complications, goes to sleep, and passes away tragically late that night. Johnny was a student in that season of life of development and education. And he was faithful to his time and his purpose, that season in life, exhibiting his drive to enter college at Harvard as late as three days before his passing. He finished his course and kept the faith of his purpose. Near the end of the book, Johnny's mother, Frances, reflects on her son's life, and even though she loved him completely, she wishes she had loved him more. She poses the question of what it means to love fully while we are alive. She writes, To me it means loving life more, being more aware of life, of one's fellow human beings, of the earth. It means obliterating in a curious but real way the ideas of evil and hate and the enemy and transmuting them with the alchemy of suffering into ideas of clarity and charity. It means caring more and more about other people, she says, at home and abroad, all over the earth. It means caring more about God. To finish the course of our lives in imitation of the faithfulness of Jesus, faithfulness to the purpose of God, means to live and love with great courage in spite of all the challenges, even death itself. It means to live in such a way that we can deny control of our lives to fear the fear of both the what-ifs and the painful realities. 
It means that we live as those baptized with Christ, having died to fear and defeat and a host of negative and destructive attitudes and feelings and behaviors, so that dying with Christ, we are raised to walk in the light of a renewed life. <clears throat> Lazarus, dear Lazarus, has given a sequel to the first part of his life an opportunity to live as a walking witness to the powerful love of God. He has a new purpose to finish the course as a sign that all eyes should turn to Jesus, that everyone should watch and listen to hear Jesus proclaim, It is finished. The story of Lazarus invites us to the scene now called Good Friday to the dying Jesus who shows us the heart of God, a heart that would rather die than not finish. God's divine heart filled with sacrificial love for the world, for you, for me, a love that will not let death be the last word, that, that will not let death be proud. John Donne's sonnet from 1609, proclaims, Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. One short sleep past we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. In this story of Lazarus, Jesus, and the palm branches, this arrival into Jerusalem, even the opposition can see that the mission of Jesus may be unstoppable. They see it in the wildfire witness of Lazarus as living proof, and so they plot to kill him who only recently escaped death. In chapter 11, they anxiously stew over the situation caused by Jesus, saying, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. They feel like the whole world has gone after Jesus, and there's nothing that they can do to stem the tide. So they determine to stop Jesus, to use death to proudly kill him in hopes of preventing him from getting to the finish line, a line they fear be because they live in darkness rather than light. Their very determination to stop Jesus is a witness to the greater resolve of Jesus to finish the course set before him, to be faithful to the last breath. Embedded in this narrative concerning Lazarus and Jesus and the crowd of palm branches is a call to us. Like Lazarus, like Jesus, we are called to finish our course faithfully in whatever lifespan we have. We are invited to complete our lives, whether they're short or long, focus more on God. We are called to fill the days of our living with purpose and courage and hope. God calls us to finish well. To, bind, to unbind ourselves from any aspects of the dark triad of self-absorption at the expense of others, of manipul manip manipulative self-empowerment at the cost of trampling on others, and of bold disregard for the feelings and experiences of others. God urges us to unbind each other from grudges and suspicions and sabotage and to remove the trappings of death and live. We are invited to argue and stand against the powers of death and destruction. We are constrained to courageously make the case for God's love demonstrated in Jesus as the best and most effective power in the world. We do well to ask ourselves, 
What is unfinished in my life? Not the home improvements, not the retirement account, not the unwashed car or the unchanged oil or the laundry or the long to-do list, but the relationships, the spiritual growth, the perfecting of love as our way of living, the intention to engage in ministry, the forgiving of that person that is now long overdue, the reconnection with that person from whom I am alienated by some past conflict or misunderstanding. It is good to ask ourselves, how might the rest of my life function as testimony and sign to the presence and performance of God? What is unfinished in this world, in this society, in this community, in Norman? What is unfinished as the work of McFarland UMC? What or who remains to be redeemed? Are we on track with our children, taking the time not only to rush them from activity to activity, but to mentor their wisdom, to hear their thoughts and their feelings, to coach their growth toward maturity? Are we engaged to guide them to overcome fears that want to embed and fester in them out of some hurt or trauma or disappointment? These are questions for parents and for grandparents and for the church. Are we keeping faith with our community and our neighbors, not only those near us and like us, but the people we pass by, hear about, or never think about who suffer in poverty or pain, tragedy or trouble, and those who wonder how the stories of this grand church, how these stones that line these walls and hold this roof and make this space, how they might cry out hosannas that bring good news to them. What about those who need the church to come to them? before they can even imagine connecting with or coming to the church. To answer these questions well, there really is good news. God is faithful. We see it in Jesus who travels into the territory of danger to give his life as the Lamb of God who brings the end of exile and sin who brings the end of the powers of death and through death and resurrection thoroughly embarrasses death and strips it of its pride. We see the faithfulness of God in those who express hopes and desires with their glad hosannas and the waving of their palm branches to signal that the mercy of God has arrived. God is faithful in the faithfulness of Jesus and enables our faithfulness in response. Every day, the Spirit of God speaks to us. Every hour, the Spirit of God is urging and inviting us to keep the faith, live with integrity, finish the race. Are you facing a decision this week, this month? Well, when you talk about it, when you calculate the pros and the cons, when you wrestle over it in your mind or through the night in your dreams or even nightmares, God is there. I believe with all my heart God is in every moment with us, whispering wisdom, tugging on our elbow, saying something in the voice of the Spirit. And so let us open up to God. Think, but also pray. Calculate, but also meditate. Search for answers on the internet and through experts 
or wherever, but also search the Scriptures for wisdom and insight. Jesus is calling our names and shouting, Come out! Come out of what binds you and find others to help you. Walk into the light and be set free. Follow the way of Jesus, faithful to the purposes of God. Walk into the rest of your life with courage and faithfulness and purpose and hope. Let us pray. Thank you, O oh God, for your eternal, enduring faithfulness made so clear in Jesus, in Jesus the Christ. And now, enter deep into our lives to help us answer the questions of what is still unfinished. What still do I have to do? And guide us by the whisper of your Spirit. In the name and the way of Jesus. Amen. And so as you go as God's faithful people, seeking to answer questions in your life, Remember that there are ways to engage during this Holy Week. You can go to our website and find those for Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter itself. And remember our special Easter offering that goes to do the good work through our Utilities Assistance Ministry. And we'll appreciate your engagement and your faithfulness in all those ways. And now may the God of all hope fill you with such joy and peace in believing that hope may abound in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.